I don't understand inflation. There's a basket of goods and services that are calculated. The price of them is calculated every year. But what's in that basket of goods and services seems to me to be a relatively arbitrary choice. I mean, what makes you think that there has, in fact, been uh, objectively reliable inflation, say, over the last 30 years, given, for, for example, that many, many manufactured goods and so forth have got dramatically cheaper. Now, I know housing in many places has skyrocketed, you know, to, to a tremendous degree. But do you, do you really feel that the, the currency has become corrupted and that you can you can and what do you rely on to make that case? What data do you rely on? I could jump in here, I think. Um... I would say unquestionably debasement of the currency. It is an arbitrary harvesting of the economic surplus a productive free market economy is creating. So as an economy gets more efficient, it generates more wealth that's passed back into mar to market actors in the form of declining prices. So we're getting smarter at making chairs, smarter at providing services, electronics, all these things. But by printing money, you're basically uh, stealing claims on that productive, on that economic surplus and doling it out arbitrarily. So we could say another way to think about this is that the free market itself, as you've described, Jordan, it's a distributed computing system. So we all have our, you know, 120 bits per second conscious attention span. You multiply that out by 8 billion market participants. That is the cognitive power of the free market right i want to emphasize that because because it's it's such an important point and it, it could easily be skipped over because you know there are people who admire the ideas of central planning and you think well maybe there's 40 people doing your central planning and so maybe they're the smartest people in the world and they're doing your central planning but they have to calculate on the fly a virtually infinite amount of information if they don't have free market prices at their disposal they have to calculate what metal is worth what nails are worth what labor is worth what rubber is worth what cleanup is worth what nursing is worth etc etc and they have to do all those comparisons and they have to do those computations and there's actually no way even technically of doing that and the alternative is to distribute that calculation across a virtually infinite number of actors or actors in the billions at least and let every single person act as a computational device and sum all that and that's what the free market does it's not it's not even in principle replaceable by a logical cognitive mechanism i can't see how well, it is that's exactly right it's not even possible that a centralized bureaucracy a centralized computing model can compete with a distributed computing model of the free market we could actually, in fact, say that the free market is a pure economic democracy. People are voting by buying and selling, and whatever price is generated on any given asset, that's effectively the truth of what it trades at. Uh, any intervention on that, any intervention, any regulation, any pricing czar as they had in the USSR, you move towards, you move along that spectrum towards an economic tyranny, where we have now the arbitrary wishes of a few overriding what the free market democracy is selecting. Um, and to tie this back to the problems with dollar, the dollar is, you know, the dollar was gold. By the way, fiat currency never emerges on the free market. That distributed computing model never selects a fiat currency by itself. It's only when uh, natural law is violated, when they step across the line of, of life, liberty, and property and say, I'm going to impose this technology on you or else. That's the only time fiat currency has ever emerged. And in fact, the dollar itself was just kind of a bait and switch. It was something redeemable for free market money, gold, that was then replaced with this, this compelled money. And again, if money is speech, we could say then that fiat currency is effectively compelled speech. It's the same thing. They're forcing a language, a language of value. They're forcing its use on you. And the, if you boil it down to brass tacks, the US dollar today and all fiat currencies, they are mechanically, they're pyramid schemes. So pyramid scheme is a a system of network marketing basically that's using uh that's useful for enriching those in higher tiers at the expense of those in lower tiers and you're constantly recruiting more uh lower tiers to enrich the top and that's okay, so let me let me draw an objection to that just briefly so let's i'm going to accept the pyramid scheme hypothesis but i'm going to say that it's a pyramid scheme that sacrifices the future to the present but that doesn't matter because the future is going to be so much more productive than the present that we can afford that leverage. It would be, so to make, this is the kernel of economics, right? Is that I can delay consumption or gratification today 
invest for the future and then enjoy more in the future. Fiat currency and central planning more generally uh, reverses that. It actually it, it induces you to consume and take on debt today and disregard the future. This is the raising of the time preference that we spoke to earlier. So, the, and the, its arbitrary nature, again, it, it's as, as Mises would describe, all centrally planned action is it runs countervailing to what the free market would choose on its own. So you're no matter what you do, the government cannot make a good decision if they're if they're coercing people to do it because they're withdrawing productive factors from the economy to fund that decision. If they want to go to war, for instance, the market may have not selected to go to war, but a government has decided that, no, we're going to pull these uh, productive factors from the economy and push us into warfare. So it's it's contradictory to the, the essence of democracy itself. Right, so you which, guys really see that Bit, Bitcoin as a, dis, you really do see it as a distributed form of government as well, in it, some it's sense. It's disruptive to, to centralized government, yes. Yeah, and, and I think one of the elements of inflation, and, and again, this is the string back to what we were talking about earlier, and I do think it is a fundamental point to make, but it, it if money is how we express our sacrifices and therefore our values, into the matrix of value hierarchies that exist in the market, then inflation is doing so without the commensurate sacrifices that everyone else needs to make into it to allow them to communicate that to the market. And so this is where the idea of pathological hierarchies is applicable, is because a, a naturally emerging market where the fidelity between one's actions, one's choices, one's valuations, and the signal that they send out into the market is pristine, and I would make the case that's what Bitcoin um, represents, whenever that is diluted in whatever capacity, you know, to a small degree or to a larger degree, that's what creates incongruencies between the matrix of value hierarchies that are out in the market. If they are pristine, if we are all able to communicate with perfection our value hierarchies to the market, we will see, in my opinion, emergent order. I don't see how it could be any other way. Where that gets thrown off is when that signal that we're sending carries al alternative information, not information that we, you know, through our divine process of you know, mediating chaos in order to bestow value on things and then express that through our actions, not that process, but through some other process of someone who controls the mechanism by which we communicate that. And so inflation is just, is changing the relationship between the matrix of value hierarchies without the commensurate sacrifices. And that is what creates pathological hierarchies. And that's what creates, you mentioned, you know, the inequality okay, so, and so the divisiveness why do, and stuff. Why do we allow this? With Now, we don't, we're not going to degenerate into conspiratorial thinking. And I'm always wary of any conversation that involves they, you know, an external actor. Like, we, we've allowed this as a, as a global community. And if, if what we've done is flawed in the manner that your analysis indicates, why have we allowed it to happen? I could say who benefits, and we could go there to begin with. But again, as I said, I'm very leery of conspiratorial thinking. I tend to think of large scale social problems as everybody's problem, you know, but so so what do you think about that? Why, why have we allowed this to happen? And let's say who benefits and why? Well, and who you know, suffers? I'm, I'm with you. And 99% of the time I attribute um, you know, the things that we see in the world that we might term evil or bad to incompetence and not uh, malevolence. Outright e evil, right, yeah, not right. malevolence. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, there's, there's many factors here, but one is it happens kind of, it happens in slow motion. And so people end up not being able to see it. For example, like you would say today, hey, I got my iPhone, I got Netflix, we're talking on Zoom, things are good and right in the world. And I, you know, I know oftentimes you discuss not to you know discredit not to go out and try to change the world not to be too critical of 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 the state of the world because the order that we experience is almost miraculous but i would say that there's an element of that that may cause you not to see the how things have become disordered i mean it's it's difficult to see that and so when we talk about the uh, disruptive effect of inflation that i just alluded to a lot of people have a difficult time seeing that. We can objectively isolate problems that are going on in the world, inequality and social problems and you know all the craziness that we see in the world, and we attribute that to fill in the blank cause. Whereas I think what we attribute most of that to is the disordering that 
results from this fractured congruence of value hierarchies that are being communicated in a market. That's where I think most of that comes from, but it, it takes time to right. play so out. It's, and dis, we, it's a form of, of faulty information. Right, and, and, and we, are, we are leveraging right now, or we are um, still benefiting from this, the, the order, the, 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 the structure that was imposed as a result of, let's say, being on a gold standard and the political and social dynamic that that fosters, in many cases, we've been living off the stability that that fosters for the, for the last several decades. I think you could make a case that despite technological advancement that may, might cause us to think, hey, things you know, aren't so bad or may cause to distract us. I think you can make the case that the equity that we've been living off of of that stability is coming to an end. And I think we're seeing that in many different cases. But, you know, I think that's why it happens in slow motion and people are not educated enough or necessarily paying attention enough to notice the relationship between all the different things that are going on. OK, so let, let me ask you guys a question about what happened in 2008. And so. And I may be completely wrong about this, but my understanding was that the, the, the 2008 crisis was fundamentally produced by a technological revolution. And the technological revolution was something like the realization that you could take investments of a certain um, risk level, mortgages, let's say, substandard mortgages, and by bundling them together in huge tranches and huge groups, you could quantify the risk. And as a consequence of quantifying the risk, you could discount, you could make the, the group of, of of, of investments more valuable than they would be as the sum of the individual investments, which I thought was a brilliant innovation. And so now these companies, banks, traded these huge tranches of subprime mortgages because they could quantify the risk. And that means that that could be accounted for financially. And so the risk was ameliorated. And the, the flaw was, well, no one realized that doing so en masse would increase the probability that housing prices would become correlated across time, across huge geographical regions, for example, across the entire United States. And so the housing market could collapse all at once. But so so I, I you could make the case that that was actually a flaw in the free market computing prowess because a technological innovation came along, warped the entire system. And then what had to happen was the political system had to rescue it. And so I watched that and I thought, well, did I was the political system embedded in the economic system? which is, I think, the argument you guys are fundamentally making, or is the economic system embedded in the political system? And is what's wrong with my analysis of what happened in 2008? What, wasn't it the case that the, the market was rescued by the, by the political actors? Is that incorrect? I the can, arson is putting out the fire. Sorry, go ahead, Rob. Yeah. No, I, was, I could start and you guys feel free to jump in. So I would first encourage you um, to, to look into what's called the Euro dollar system which is essentially these, these, this, we control the pyramid scheme in the US, the domestic uh, dollar supply, but there's this offshore derivative system where everyone's trying to peg the dollars that the central bank doesn't control. That's actually um, been considered to be at the root of the 2008 crisis. And then the, this was kind of a cover story, but if we just get back to error, so we could say risk is error, right? So there was this embedded risk that we thought we had calculated and contained but what was actually happening is because we have centrally planned money, it's pushing hidden risk into the economy, right? Because the free market distributed intelligence, intelligence being defined as error correction, it's mitigated by the central planning of money. So these hidden risks accumulate, and that's why we've had increased mm -hmm, volatility mm -hmm. since 1971. We have these huge economic booms. We print a bunch of money. Inflation runs hot, but so do assets. Everyone thinks they're doing really well. And then we have these catastrophic retracements back to economic reality. And actually that's the, because the one, incremental incremental reaction to risk is not is not being implemented. That's what you diverging expect, right? perceptions from reality effectively. Mm -hmm. So even the, mm -hmm. the correction in March 2020, that was the sharpest liquidity collapse in the history of markets. It was faster than 1929. So we would expect as more fiat currency, which is artificial liquidity, is pumped into the system, it's further distorting this economic perceptual faculty and creates even more volatile boom and bust. This is the Austrian business cycle theory in a nutshell. Um, and mm. the only way mm. this the only way to resolve this is to let the free market clear errors. That's what it does. That's what consciousness does too, by the way. Mm -hmm. So you can think mm -hmm. of the free market as our mm -hmm. our interconnected consciousnesses 
mediated by the price signal. When you disturb the price signal, our consciousnesses become divided and we have increased errors and blow ups. Well, that's why I suggest to people that they don't engage in deception because they distort the value signals and they warp their own consciousness. It's a very dangerous thing to do. That's right. Because exactly. you only fiat use currents. deception that's to- That's exactly to, what money does. That's exactly yeah. what fiat money does. Fiat currency is a living lie. That's what that's that's it in a nutshell. And maybe to to bring this home, the question you asked could also be uh, rephrased to to pick a more like uh, an example that people might be familiar with. You could also ask like, was the drug addict or was uh, the person suffering from alcoholism saved by the alcohol because he suffered withdrawal? And that's like a, a very similar question. And then you could argue, yes, we gave we gave him the substance and he survived, so it was a good thing, and uh, he made it through. But what would actually be necessary is kind of you know like uh, that's not the cure. You 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 would need to quit cold turkey, and that's what Bitcoiners are arguing, or just in general people advocating for sound money are arguing that we need to get off the fiat standard that can be arbitrarily man manipulated and ma manipulates the price signals, manipulates. The the whole economy.